Hello, and thank you for joining us for this conversation about city parks now and in the future during Park Pride's annual Parks and Green Space Conference. These regional convenings are essential to leverage the power of parks in our communities now more than ever. I'm Catherine Nagel, the Executive Director of City Parks Alliance, the nationwide urban parks advocacy network. And I'm pleased to be moderating this important discussion on how the pandemic, economic fallout, and Black Lives Matter movement have brought about a greater awareness of the critical role that parks, recreation, and the public realm play in meeting the needs of urban residents, particularly in times of crisis. During the next hour, two of our nation's top park and recreation leaders will share their insights on how recent events have forced us to think differently about our common space and the potential for community healing through the lens of equity and race that currently divides us to make cities more welcoming, just, and healthy for all. Some of the questions we'll be exploring include, how can we reclaim parks and the urban realm to be more flexibly designed and managed to accommodate not only play, but public protest and peacemaking as well? What are the ways that programming and recreational activities can recognize and celebrate historically underrepresented stories, cultural and racial perspectives, and community ideals? And how have the past few months magnified the importance of access to close to home nature for people's mental health, especially in undersourced neighborhoods? We are fortunate to have with us on this call, Mitchell Silver and Catherine Ott Lovell. Mitchell Silver became commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation in 2014. He is an award-winning planner with more than 30 years of experience and is internationally recognized for his leadership in the planning profession and on contemporary planning issues. And in fact, is the past president of the American Planning Association. Commissioner Silver oversees management, planning, and operations of nearly 30,000 acres of parkland, which includes parks, playgrounds, beaches, marinas, recreation centers, wilderness areas, and other assets. One of his signature accomplishments has been the Parks Without Borders initiative that has redesigned parks to make them more open, welcoming, and accessible by improving entrances edges and park adjacent spaces in neighborhoods throughout the city. Catherine Ott Lovell was appointed to her position as commissioner of Philadelphia's Park and Rec Recreation Department in 2016. She oversees more than 10,000 acres of land, hundreds of playgrounds and buildings, extensive trail systems, and thousands of programs and events throughout Philadelphia's park and recreation system. During her tenure, she has established a renewed vision toward an equitable and exceptional parks and recreation system that connects people to each other and to the natural world through high quality, relevant and accessible programs. Of note is her leadership on the city's rebuild plan that is activating neighborhoods across Philadelphia by connecting parks with other civic assets such as libraries. We've asked each of them to provide some reflections as they've led their city agencies and adapted during the crises of the last six months, as well as what they're seeing moving forward. I'll follow up with some questions to the panelists, and then during the last part of the call, we'll take questions from the audience. So to kick it off, let's turn to Mitchell Silver. Thank you, Catherine. It's certainly a pleasure to be here. Um, very excited to uh, share uh, my points uh, about what I'm calling the disruption uh, of 2020. Uh, and I'll be discussing basically what has been going on with both uh, dealing with both COVID and some of the isolation. I always want to take a step back and what we can learn from the 1918 pandemic. This is certainly not the first time this planet has a uh, pandemic. But if you see back 100 years ago, it was 500 million people affected and 50 million deaths. So clearly this is a serious matter of COVID-19, 
uh, but it's something we could learn from from the past pandemic. Uh, what we did learn is from the past pandemic uh, that we saw this explosion of green space, whether it's Central Park or parks across the country. Uh, people recognized that after the pandemic, we had to offer those lungs, those outdoor spaces for people to get healthy. And we all know parks aren't just for physical health, it's also for mental health. And it's the fresh air, building the immune system, getting that vit vitamin D that's very important. And we want to make sure we learn lessons from the last pandemic. Uh, this is a very uh, important article, all you should read from history.com. And there are many more talking about what we learned from the past pandemic. And there's a lot of similarities if you take a look back. Uh, back then, uh, people were really saying you must wear your mask. Uh, people were getting quite intense confronting other individuals. So as we can see, this is certainly something that happened 100 years ago, but it's happening again here today. But as we look at what's happening today, uh, when the pandemic first started, there's no surprise. A lot of our park elements had to close. Those that really presented a challenge uh, for social distancing, uh, where there was people in close proximity, and we really couldn't sanitize some of the play equipment. So this was a landscape we've seen in many of our parks. We had to close a lot of our spaces to ensure people remain safe. In New York City, we came up with this sign, keep this far apart. It was actually six feet long, so we could make sure people understood physically what that looked like. But our entire park system started closing, except for some of the large parks. Uh, and then here's an example uh, in Fort Greene Park of what it looked like in real time. One of people understood if our large parks were going to stay open, that people had to keep their distance. Uh, and we got very active. Uh, for those parks, we wanted to make sure people did wear a mask. Our rangers, we started giving mask giveaways. We gave well over several million masks to people at that time that could not get access to a mask to encourage people to get outdoors, social distance, but you must, must wear your mask. And then uh, we started becoming uh, dealing with this dilemma of crowded versus physical distancing. Now, this is a scene of Sheep Meadow and Central Park. A lot of people started calling to complain, uh, but couples, people of the same hope can be together, but they still had to be within a six foot distance from other groups. So we had to really educate the public. This is crowded, but it meets our goals for physical distancing. And this is something we had to continually educate the public. Domino Park became very creative. Right up to the signs, they drew their circle. This image actually went global. Other parks throughout the country started actually replicating what Domino Park did. Uh, it is a quite, uh, I think, a, a, a fascinating way of addressing it, and people are complying. They now know what it is to physical distance, and so we're talking about what can we do in the future uh, should, unfortunately, we have another pandemic, but this is one creative approach. And I'm a runner. What I found quite enjoyable is that you didn't get to see your friends. It was like Groundhog Day, the same people again and again. And here are these chance encounters during COVID. A friend of mine, a running mate I saw in the Bronx, you could tell she was very happy to see me. So it was these wonderful chance encounters. It was like finding gold in this age of COVID. And we're recognizing now how important those physical contacts and social contacts are as we're coming out of it. But we knew that uh, while all of our park features were closed, uh, we had to find more places to open up for the public to enjoy. Just our large parks were open, but our smaller parks were closed. And so the city council and mayor agreed to open up 100 miles of open streets. Uh, a lot of them were opened up for people just to get exercise. It would close off for traffic. And now a lot of our retail operations and restaurants were also using these open streets. In addition, we came up with a concept called Cool It NYC in conjunction with these streets that are now closed. We're activating fire hydrants when it gets hot. We're putting sprinklers and spray features in a lot of our uh, playgrounds just to help cool people off. And we have play streets so people can go out there and enjoy themselves if they're not within a close distance to a park. And we were particularly concerned because COVID were affecting black and brown communities the most. And so we took a hard look at the equity measure to see how this was affecting populations of color. Uh, a lot of the large parks were not in close proximity to these communities, and so we had to figure out what we can do. Uh, we did analysis very early on to see what the impact was, and in fact, we did find out that those that were impacted the most by COVID, black and brown communities, are the ones that did have some 10-minute walk gaps or close proximity uh, to a park. So the open streets concept helped a great deal until we're able to open up some of those playgrounds.
And here's more examples of the open streets and shared streets. Initially, it started just for guys, uh, but now what's happening across the country is now we're opening up these streets for retail, for socializing, and we're actually trying to find out if this is something we can do in the future. The mayor's looking at it. We're extending this uh, really till the end of October, and then we'll see if this is something we can activate next year since it's been so successful. So this is now becoming part of a new reality for many cities across the country. So in terms of what the new normals, people ask me this question often, and I really don't know. There are some that's going to want to, you know, hold off and they're not ready to come back. There are others that want to come back right away. And then there are others that want to wait and see. Uh, we're just not sure what's going to happen with these large public events. Uh, our essential park workers have been coming to work from the very beginning, keeping our parks clean. Like many park systems across the country, as a result of reduced revenue, we're now reducing our park staff, and here's some examples in our parks because we just cannot keep up demand. This was a, a, a big event that happened in Prospect Park, and they, these are the scenes that we're seeing all over New York City because we're down about 1,700 seasonals. So we are starting a campaign where people now can you know, carry in, carry out, and kind of work with volunteers to help clean up our parks. But this is a scene we're seeing more and more throughout our park system. Here's just another scene of Prospect Park. <laughs> there was a front page article this morning in the New York Post. People are now trying to uh, get in the connection that the lack of staff is now producing uh, less maintained parks. In the midst of all this going on, uh, around the end of May, uh, we had one incident of Christian Cooper in Central Park. He was a birder and he challenged a woman of having a dog off leash. Uh, that incident went viral. And then we had the death of George Floyd. That sent off a chain reaction not just the isolation, but now we have the social and racial unrest. And we saw people gravitating to our parks to protest. We support the First Amendment, and they often will gravitate toward public space. And so throughout New York City, and I'm sure this country, people marched on the street, they marched in parks. Uh, this is an East River Park. Uh, you see these symbols of the place. Uh, we leave them up for a while and don't remove them right away out of respect for the protest. However, if it's uh, derogatory graffiti, uh, that will remove right away. But if we see a memorial or anything related to Black Lives Matter, we will let it stay there for at least 30 days. Here's another memorial right next to our parks, Fort Greene in Brooklyn. As I stated, if it was just derogatory information, we'll take it down. Uh, but if it's a memorial, we'll leave it up out of respect that they're protesting and a memorial for those that have passed away. All over the place, Barclay Center, the, the whole movement is really changing the way we're thinking about parks and public space, and in particular, how we're dealing with Black Americans, Black and Brown Americans, both the public, but also our staff. We had to have a lot of conversations and work with our staff about how to deal with some of these issues. Here's more protests. Uh, this one is in East River Park again, and now we're seeing a rise of running protests, not just marching protests. Here's another one just occurred about two weeks ago. And as a result, uh, our black staff were troubled by what was going on. So we decided to have a phone call just to allow our staff to reflect. As a black commissioner, I wanted to show solidarity with our staff and the protesters. And so we held a series of phone calls to talk about how our staff felt about all the protests. And it was moving. Uh, you couldn't get through one of these phone calls without crying. The stories were so powerful. And so out of these conversations, this happened in early June, our staff felt they wanted to show solidarity. And what we decided to do was go into one of our parks and rename it. In this case, it's called Juneteenth Grove. We unveiled it on June 19th, uh, the, the day of June 19th. We 19 trees and we painted 19 benches, the Pan-African colors. And there's one of our staff members that's now painting the bench. We wanted this space to be one of our protests, uh, Wherever it is, we wanted to make sure we recognize that we had this public space that people could enjoy. The 19 trees, again, were also planted to show a sign of life for those that had passed, but also to leave our branches out to heaven for the future. And now June was opened up and it was very powerful. To our staff, it was very important because they wanted to do something. They wanted to show solidarity. We've asked other parks about the park system 
to also paint a bench in their park, the Pan-African Colors, that has happened across the city to show solidarity. And we agreed to take a look at all of our park names for both our parks and our buildings to see when we can what we can rename them to a prominent person of color, either in New York or, in the, or around the world. And that process is underway and we'll unveil those names on Black Solidarity Day, which is the day before the election day this year. So in terms of what's next, I just want to fast forward ahead. We certainly realize that more streets will be given to people, whether it's for biking, playing, dining. Uh, we expect sidewalks to get wider. There are some cities and places across the country that don't have enough sidewalk width to social distance. We expect there be increase of more green space. Certainly there'll be fewer large gatherings until a vaccine is developed. We're going to see more hand sanitizing in places you can wash your hands so people feel safe. Uh, there are going to be a big focus on open spaces where people can social distance. We want to be very focused on equity now that COVID has unveiled a lot of equity within our park system. And so those are some of the things that we'll be looking for, I believe, all of us going into the future. And I want to close on this slide because this uh, the whole Juneteenth, Juneteenth Grove was very meaningful to me personally. So I'll share with you the tree that I helped plant and prayed for that tree. And it was an honor and a privilege to work with the protesters, to work with staff, and to actually honor this very sacred space in honor of Juneteenth and Black Lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitchell. And uh, now we'll hear, hear from Catherine Otlevel. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here today and uh, want to thank City Parks Alliance and, and everybody um, involved in the Park Pride Conference for having me. Um, uh, just a quick overview of our park system um, here in Philadelphia. Uh, we have a fairly large park system, uh, parks and rec system, with parks making up about 11% of our total land mass. Um, we have 160 uh, recreation centers, 140 neighborhood parks, about 70 pools, five golf courses, six senior centers five ice rinks, et cetera. Um, we have a staff of about 700 full-time employees and at any given time, around 2,000 uh, seasonal and part-time staff. Um, when the pandemic hit, like most other parks and rec systems, we spent the first few weeks just struggling to figure things out. Um, you know, what, what should close, what should stay open, uh, who should keep working, where should they keep working? You know, we had to quickly identify what our truly core essential services were. Um, and we had to quickly determine, you know, how do we adapt um, as a city department, as a park and recreation system uh, to help fill the service voids amidst this pandemic? Where was the help needed in the city? And what skills and abilities and services could our department offer to help fill those critical voids? Um, and so, one, you know, we are one of the largest meal providers um, in the city of Philadelphia. We provide over 2 million meals each year to children throughout the city at our recreation center. So we knew that we could be a key partner in the city's food access um, uh, efforts. And the city waged a huge food access um, program amidst uh, the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the city set up a food warehouse where teams of our volunteers were packing boxes of food to distribute at pantries uh, throughout the city. Um, sorry, I'm trying to advance. There we go. Um, when our rec centers closed, we assigned our recreation leaders to the warehouse uh, to help pack the boxes. And then we opened 13 of our recreation centers as, um, as food pantries. We also distributed individual meals uh, to children and adults, both at our centers and at schools throughout the city. Uh, one of the most helpful things for me throughout this pandemic uh, was has been a weekly and biweekly call with other urban parks and rec leaders uh, throughout the country, which has been hosted by the National Parks and Rec Association. On those weekly calls, we learned about efforts, um, you know, problems, issues, ideas um, that were happening uh, at in urban parks throughout the throughout the country. And it was through those calls that we um, learned about the efforts to deploy staff as social distance ambassadors throughout 
about parks. And I want to thank Mitch Silver and his entire team at New York City Parks for sharing their program model with us. We were able to quickly put together our own social distance ambassador teams um, who um, were out in parks, just like in New York and Seattle and Miami and so many other cities, um, distributing masks, distributing information, letting people know how to how to be, keep safe. Um, we kept all of our parks open throughout the pandemic, um, including all of our trails, and they were incredibly well used. Um, and so while we saw a huge uptick in people in the parks, um, even during the stay at home order, you know, we really had to try and reinforce but with folks the importance of not just keeping a mask on, keeping six feet apart, but also, um, you know, making sure people were going to parks close to their homes if possible and making sure that they limited their time in parks to make sure we had space and, um, you know, available for all the other park users, people who wanted to use those parks. Um, and then, you know, not only did we have to adapt, you know, but we really needed to establish our relevancy um, in terms of, you know, this is a time when so many questions are stirring around, um, you know, what is an essential service in the city of Philadelphia? And so, you know, with budgets being drastically reduced um, and mass layoffs happening all over, not just here in Philadelphia, but throughout the country, um, you know, we had to think quickly about how we could really remain relevant to um, our users and to the citizens of our city. And so we, like many other cities, developed virtual programming, um, um, engaging dozens of our program staff, not just in designing and hosting the programs online, but also in the technical support and marketing and promotion of the of the programs, which we call Parks and Rec at Home. Um, and we were thrilled because we had, um, you know, just um, hundreds of thousands of folks participate um, in our pro in our Parks and Rec at Home. Um, and it was a huge success. We had everything from, you know, virtual cake decorating to virtual dance parties, tours of parks, um, tours of urban farms and urban gardens, um, and tours of our facilities. So, so it was a, a huge success and we're tremendously grateful to um, all of our staff who participated in, the, in that. Um, we had to make a difficult decision um, in April, early May about whether or not we were going to host our summer camps. Um, we typically host about 10,000 kids um, in our summer camp in the summer at about 150 camps. Um, Philadelphia has a has a very high poverty rate. We're one of the poorest big cities. Um, we have about 25 percent of our residents living on or below the poverty line. And so we were uniquely aware of the impact the pandemic had had on families and on young people, especially who, you know, many of whom um, maybe weren't getting regular meals, but also weren't. Um, in really involved in those positive adult um, relationships that um, our, our camps and our, our programs provide. And so we decided that we would host our summer camps. We um, decided that we would have a six-week program. It would operate from nine to three every day at 120 sites. Um, we eventually enrolled about 1,800 kids um, in the programs. Uh, we had a, you know, had to develop a, a massive standard operating procedure, um, you know, to manage the safety um, of, of our um, um, you know, of our, our camps, but I'm really proud to say that we ended those camps on Friday and um, we only had one case um, throughout the entire uh, camp. So um, really excited to, to um, you know, to have that great success and, you know, give a tremendous amount of kudos to our staff who just worked so hard to make sure that that kids and themselves stayed safe, um, you know, throughout throughout our camps. Um, and then, you know, in an effort, again, to stay relevant, um, we had a lot of conversations at a, um, you know, at a senior level in the city of Philadelphia with the mayor's office and um, our managing director's office around, you know, what could we do for kids that can't get to summer camp or what can we do? Um, you know, our recreation centers are closed. Our, we made a difficult decision to close our um, our pools. Our, like I said, our rec centers were closed except for camps. So, you know, how are we going to save summer for young people throughout the city of Philadelphia? Philadelphia. And um, so we've had this Play Streets program, as many cities do. We've had this program for 60 years. And essentially, over the past 60 years, it's really just been a way to distribute meals to young people. So it's a program where, um, you know, we distribute about 20,000 meals a day um, to children at around three to 350 blocks throughout the city. Um, and, um, you know, the idea was, you know, with rec centers closed, 
um, except for camps. Um, you know, how do we get to kids if kid can't, kids can't get to us? And so we decided to, to double down on our Play Streets program. We raised a little over $600,000 in about five and a half weeks um, from the private sector. And, you know, we decided that we would enhance the Play Street program. In addition to bringing those meals every day to kids, we would bring fun and equipment and programs and activities. And so um, we had this idea um, to create these kits, um, everything from um, a cooling kit to a sports kit, art kits, um, reading kits, basically setting up our horticulture center as a Play Streets warehouse where all of these items were delivered and sorted and then prepared to go out to um, these 300 streets. And I should mention that the 300 Play Streets are staffed um, by primarily by volunteers, so by um, residents in the community that raise their hand and offer to host a Play Street. Um, in the cooling kits, we had everything from you know pop-up tents to umbrellas, um, super soakers for every everyone, tens of thousands of water guns for kids, water balloons, personal misting fans. Um, and then the art kits, we had tons of arts and crafts, sports kits, everything, flag football kits to soccer balls, playground balls, um, wiffle bats and balls, jump ropes, et cetera. Um, so just things to really, um, you know, bring fun to kids. Um, we also unveiled new signage um, for all of the play streets just to um, really bring them to life in new ways. And then we partnered with some design firms, a design firm in California called KDI that that created these mobile uh, portable play landscapes and also a local firm called Tiny WPA that built um, dozens of seesaws um, that we uh, brought around to the perfect social distancing play equipment that we took around to, um, to all of the streets. And um, it was just a huge success. In addition to um, the play landscapes and um, the equipment, we also had um, programs that we brought to each of the streets. So um, we had 50 streets in some of the most heat vulnerable communities, some of the poor communities that we designated as super streets. And to the super streets, we provided daily programs, everything from um, a junior barbershop academy that came out and did barber demonstrations, as well as gave out free haircuts to um, uh, DJ dance parties with local treat vendors, giving out free treats to the kids, to the local professional sports teams coming out and doing sports clinics. Everybody who participated had to sign waivers and agreements and go through a training to make sure that we could keep things as safe as possible. Um, but but our play streets have been going on now for um, close to seven weeks and um, they end on this Friday. So um, again, just a really great way that we were able to sort of save summer for the young people um, in Philadelphia. Um, this is my favorite picture. Um, it is of a young boy at our opening of play streets with our local Philly fanatic um, who begged uh, throughout the speaking program if he could say a few words. And so he did at the end and it was just a really, a really fun shot. So um you know, again, I, I think um, everything that I presented on, I just really wanted to reinforce how important it is for, you know, um, parks and recreation systems throughout the country to um, not just um, survive, but to really adapt and remain relevant at a time in a time like a pandemic. It really gives us a chance to reinforce what we've always known, that parks and recreation um, programs and um, spaces are, are essential to us in every city and every town in the country um, and really critical that we drive that message home, especially in a time when funding, um, you know, is being cut. And we are all in these tremendous, um, you know, um, under this tremendous fiscal pressure. Um, it, it's, it might be easy for some, um, uh, you know, uh, folks to make the decision to, um, you know, to, to cut or dismantle our parks and recreation systems. And it's at a time when I think they're needed more than ever. Um, so we have to remain relevant, we have to adapt, um, and we have to make sure that we drive home, um, you know, the essentialness of what we provide uh, in this industry. So thank you so much for having me. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. And we'll wait for um, Mitchell to get back on. I wanted to um, uh, ask you a few questions. It looks like uh, we're having a few technical difficulties with um, Mitch's uh, connection. So I'll throw the first question out to you, uh, Catherine. Oh, there he is. Great. Uh, so to, to Catherine and, and Mitchell, um, you know, in the parks community, you know, historically, we've talked about the health benefits of parks. And I think um, we really, you know, often think about the physical uh, benefits. Uh, but what has struck us uh, over the past six months is truly how uh, our parks and open space um, have helped all of us 
uh, mentally. So we're really looking at the mental health, mental health benefits of parks, I think, in a new way. Um, but for many communities, the pandemic has exacerbated uh, existing trauma in neighborhoods uh, for children that experience that every day. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you saw uh, during the past six months and how important uh, our parks and local uh, open spaces were to communities and, and where you see uh, possible connections with the mental health community uh, moving forward. You know, I think, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, March and April, when um, Philadelphia was under a stay at home order and we saw people, um, you know, who would leave their houses for, you know, a few hours at a time, a precious time when they felt comfortable to leave and they would they would gravitate Uh, to parks and spaces. And you know, how inspiring that was. And I remember feeling just so optimistic that, you know, we were finally, um, you know, going to get our due, if you will, you know, and that we would finally be recognized as this critical essential service. Um, and I, I do think that that happened. Um, but I, 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 what I, I guess what I want to juxtapose that with is, you know, then we had to cut, um, $13 $13 million from our budget or 20% um, of our budget come April. And to me, you know, I was very deflated because I thought here, um, if, if we've proven nothing else during this pandemic, we've proven that, um, you know, Parks and Rec is truly essential and that um, it is critical for the physical and mental health. Um, it's, the, it's, you know, the the first thing people went to, um, you know, in, in this time of crisis. Um, and yet um, we weren't seeing... Um, we weren't seeing that come true uh, in terms of the budget process. And so I also, while I think it's incredibly important and nobody will argue the impact that parks and public space and, and, and even recreation programs have on physical and mental health, I think that that connection isn't made um, in terms of where the funding can come from to support um, to support park and recreation. And all of our funding in Philadelphia for Parks and Rec comes from our general fund. And I would love to make the case that our Department of Behavior Health and our Department of, of Public Health and our Department of Human services should should and could be funding um, our system as well. Great. Mitchell, do you want to add uh, your perspective on that question? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, there was no question when COVID first started. We started seeing uh, a lot of people having mental health issues, uh, depression, isolating, and the fact that parks were open. I remember being interviewed for one uh, magazine and somebody said that it just gives you hope. The fact that everything is closed, but parks gave them hope. And so I started calling them sanctuaries of sanity. It was the only social Mm -hmm. gathering place that was open. Yes, you had a social distance. And we're seeing today uh, the whole issue about mental illness, uh, mental health related issues as a result of COVID and isolation. And so parks is at one place that you can de-stress it can reduce anxiety just to be outdoors. Uh, Like Catherine, uh, I was very excited when I found out how important parks were and everything was was closed but parks. And these workers came to work. And then when the budget cuts came along, it was very difficult to see how little by little we were not able to bring all our staff back to help keep our parks clean. And people are noticing. They're saying things now. We're working, like I said, on volunteers to help clean our parks, to carry in, carry out policy. Those are all the things that we're trying to do. Uh, But it's no question that we've known all along that being in green space is a great asset to everyone's mental health. And so my hope is that we're going to learn from this, uh, figure out how to keep those parks open so that people could help uh, get healthier, quicker, physical, as well as mental health. Great. Um, I'm, I'm going to respond to a question that, uh, that d- just came in about um, the image that was shown of Prospect Park. And, it, um, and it's really about um, maintenance. Um, and so as budgets are, are cut, um, you know, many parks commissioners uh, in cities throughout the country are struggling uh, to respond to this increased use with inadequate resources. And so how can groups like Park Pride in Atlanta help reframe the conversation to recognize the role of park maintenance workers who are on the front lines? Well, you saw the image of Prospect Park. That's one that's near me. Um, Actually, as we're speaking, my staff's working on a anti-litter campaign that has several fronts. 
Uh, we are now reaching out to local communities that use those parks uh, to send a very simple message. Please carry in, carry out. Uh, we need volunteer support to help keep our parks clean. Please support the park worker. And right now there are some that are being very negative. You know, what's happening? Why aren't you cleaning the parks and cutting the grass? But we're getting the message out right now that we need support uh, through this very difficult time. Uh, we're reaching out to our conservancy partners. They're struggling as well with reduced revenue from events that they use to help serve the park. So it's really across the board. But we're reaching out to the public, like saying, during this time, go outdoors, still get the fresh air, help us clean up, but also help support us by taking your trash out or putting it near a trash receptacle so you would not see an event that you saw like that in Prospect Park. It was troubling. And then even the morale of our staff, I mean, they work hard Monday morning to see a scene like that it could be demoralizing. And so we just want to make sure it's a full partnership, everyone to help make sure we keep our parks clean during this very difficult time. I echo everything Mitch just said. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, well, Catherine, there's another question that's come in for you. Can you share camp safety protocols so that we can help get our parks back open for kids? Yeah, of course we can. We have, a, um, you know, like I said, a, a pretty substantial SOP that we developed. Um, we copy, barred, and still stole from everybody else. So ours is just a, a conglomeration of uh, the YMCA's and New York's and San Francisco's and everybody else's who made theirs public. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, we are now thinking about what we're going to do in the fall. Um, and we're, we're coming up with, you know, different scenarios and plans of how we're going to support our school district that is going virtual. Um, and and, um, you know, I will say that um, I feel pretty confident in the success that we had um, in um, in the summer to think that we can open uh, open our recreation centers as um, learning resource centers for for young people this fall for children that either, um, you know, are um, have a, parents who are essential workers and need care or for children that don't have access to the Internet. We are, um, you know, working to see how we can now um, support support folks in the fall. Um, but it, it, I won't I don't want to undermine the effort that went into this on an individual level from each of our staff members. And, um, you know, there was a, a certain amount of fear. And I think that's important to recognize as well. Um, you know, we agreed to open our summer camps and our staff were fearful, you know, even, you know, in, during the trainings and in conversations, you know, fearful that they, um, you know, would have the resources that they needed and the training they needed to uphold um, the operating procedures, but then also fearful for their themselves, you know, that they might contract this virus and bring it home to their own family. So, you know, uh, there has to be a very um, human element to the training and, and uh, you know, a lot of empathy involved. Um, I went out to camps every single day um, to make sure that, you know, I was um, meeting people one on one and thanking them individually and talking to them and supporting them in person. And I think that's just it's incredibly important for us to understand the human toll. And as you said, Catherine, the mental toll that this this um, new pandemic is taking on people, including our staff. Thank you. I, I have a question about, you know, what your staff is doing is incredible. And I think moving forward, the, the question I have is, how do you design and manage for all of these um, uh, functions that the public realm is now taking on? I mean, we've got play, we've got protests, we've got peacemaking. How are you, how do you think about this in terms of how you, um, guide your staff or, or what are your departments doing to, to really think about how we, we design to be as, as flexible and inclusive as possible? Well, I'm sure Catherine's going to agree, but parks employees, they are a flexible, resilient bunch between public programs, forestry, horticulture, maintenance, you name it. We just adapt to the circumstances. So I think for one, we are going to look at the public realm very differently. Uh, right now, most cities, you know, they have about 10 to 15 percent of their city is uh, parks or green space. And then another 25 to 30 percent is streets and sidewalks. So we have to look at our public realm very differently going forward. Uh, that's you mentioned uh, in the introduction about our parks on our borders. That's to re-envision sidewalks as the outer park, rethink our streets, because now post-COVID, uh, all of it is now in high demand for the public. And so we just want to make sure we re-envision the public realm. Parks, streets, sidewalks, parks plays a role in that. 
Public Works and Department of Transportation plays a role in that. So I think now as cities of the future, we have to be more resilient and adaptive on how we accommodate the public because we're having protests on the street, in plazas and parks, and it's not something that each agency can divide up. We have to rethink the public realm going forward and parks will play a huge role in that effort. Catherine, how about you? Yeah, I think for me, it goes back to Catherine, the funding. Um, I mean, it is just, you know, and I I, I, would, I probably would speak differently if this was a local panel as opposed to one that's not local, um, you know, when I can't be as candid. But um, to me, it just reinforces that it, it's such a no brainer to um, to support, you know, to support parks and, and public and open space. I mean, they have literally been the epicenter of, um, of all activity for the last six months of this pandemic. Whether it's for people's emotional and physical health, whether it's for people's, um, you know, political, you know, displays, um, you know, we have encampments. People are literally living in our parks right now, you know, um, throughout our system, homeless encampments. Um, I mean, they're they're, um, and and now we're we're about to, you know, open as 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 digital access centers because our schools won't open. You know, we're opening. We opened this summer and schools did it. We're opening this fall and schools didn't. You know, and yet. Schools are funded, you know, and, and again, not enough in Philadelphia, but far more fairly than parks and recreation centers. And I just, I implore organizations like Park Pride and other, you know, um, nonprofit organizations throughout the country to, you know, to to just um, use this pandemic. Don't waste a good pandemic. <laughs> use this pandemic um, to shift this narrative on a national level. Um, that that you know, parks aren't just infrastructure. They, of course our infrastructure, but of course they are essential services and provide essential services um, to, to everyone in this country. You know, we have got to shift that narrative um, or we're con- con- gonna continue to beg, borrow and steal. I totally agree with Mitch. Parks and recreation staff are incredible. They are unsung heroes. They are, I say they are scrappy. Um, you know, you want, you, want a, you want something done, you go find a parks and recreation professional to get that job done. But, you know, it goes, um, you know, unrequited, it goes unrecognized, it goes under-resourced, unthanked. And, um, you know, w- when does that end? You know, when, do, when are we really able to change that conversation at a national and local level? Yeah, and, and just to add, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, his son died, I believe, of cholera. And, you know, this is a person that just helped us reimagine parks and green space here in the United States. Uh, And the slide I showed you earlier, we have to learn after each pandemic, there was an increase in explosion of green space because they recognized the importance of parks. I agree with Catherine. Schools are important, but this is really the age of parks post-COVID or when we get to post-COVID that we have to make sure that we increase it, we support it, because in a time of a crisis like this, it was parks that was an unsung hero and continues to be through this pandemic. Yeah, if you look back, I mean, Frederick Mall Olmsted, you know, his whole idea was that parks should not just be for the wealthy and for the affluent. They were meant to be a tool to serve democracy, um, to increase and enhance democracy in cities. And when have we ever needed that more than in 2020? <laughs> um, so, again, I think we need to just, you know, become as emboldened as possible to drive that message home and to make sure people understand that this is not just about the green space. This is not just about about the environment, as important and critical as that is. Um, This is about so much more. This is about the future of our cities and the future of our democracy and how it plays out in our public spaces. Since we're talking about funding, can we talk about philanthropy? I know that Catherine in in Philadelphia, the philanthropic community has really uh, stepped up. uh, But your, your public budgets have been cut significantly, as you've mentioned. What do you see as the relationship between the public and the private sector moving forward, particularly as we think about the need for funding for, for parks and neighborhoods where, where people don't have as much access? Mitch, I don't know if you want to go first. <laughs> I'll let you go first because uh, okay. it's not a good answer. So. <laughs> it's not a good answer. Uh, I wanted to have, I wanted to play good cop, bad cop. Um, you know, um, 
we rely so much on philanthropy here in Philadelphia and we don't have enough of it. Um, you know, our, our foundations and our corporations, um, you know, I think uh, our foundations especially do, I think as much as they can, I think our corporations, you know, perhaps don't do enough. Um, and, um, I don't feel like there's, uh, you know, in a city where we do have a 25% poverty rate, there is such a competition for, um, you know, for those philanthropic funds, because we just have, you know, so many other pressing issues. Um, so I wish it wasn't, there wasn't that much of a responsibility on philanthropy. Um, I also worry, uh, about the, um, you know, inequity, um, that's involved with, um, you know, uh, conservancies, um, not our own conservancy here in Philadelphia, which is one of the only citywide conservancies and supports um, all parks and all neighborhoods. But, you know, conservancies and friends groups that pop up for, um, you know, for, um, you know, parks and more affluent neighborhoods, there's just not that same means in, in underserved communities, um, which is why a program like our Play Streets program was so important because it was, you know, really an effort to raise private dollars and put them into um, those underserved communities um, and why the rebuild initiative in Philadelphia, our, our capital investment plan is is so important as well. Um, but um, you know, again, I think that the we have too much of a burden on philanthropy, and um, perhaps not enough of a burden um, or enough of a um, effort to figure out what other dedicated funding sources, revenue sources, um, could be used to better support parks and recreation. Uh, we need to diversify where our funding comes from, not just from philanthropy, not just from the general fund, but what other ways can we capture revenue? To, um, to support us long term. So like I said, uh, the picture in New York is not great. Uh, we have a number of conservancies, all of them are struggling. Uh, and so it's going to be difficult for us to reach out to them to help us support some of the other parks, although they're doing the best that they can. Uh, Catherine's right. There are so many needs out there that it's very difficult to approach some of the philanthropic organizations to support parks. There was a coalition that were able to acquire some funds. They were successful through a number of philanthropic groups led by, I believe, uh, Prospect Park Alliance and some others led that effort. Uh, but that was a short-term help. So I think long-term is continually going to be a challenge as they're looking at all the needs out there as a result of it. And in terms of our conservancies, they can't hold events. They draw their revenue from a lot of these special events, and that's just not happening this year. So it's going to be a very difficult time until we come out of this. Uh, so that's why I'm saying in New York, it's not the best news. Even those groups that give us money for public programming, we can't have a lot of those programming events in our parks because of the social distance limitations. So for now, it's not good. But I'm optimistic as things slightly improve, the philanthropic group's going to step up to really help our parks. Right. And so uh, Philadelphia, New York and Atlanta are uh, you know, a few of a few cities that actually have park advocacy organizations locally. Uh, and so the role of advocacy uh, to talk about the multiple benefits of of parks and recreation has never been greater. But those groups as well <laughs> need yes. philanthropic support. So uh, I, I think part of park Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was the City Parks Foundation, our citywide entity that's the one that pushed hard to get some philanthropic support mm -hmm. for some of the parks. So my, my, my correction right there. Right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about increasing access to nature. Um, you know, in dense cities, not everyone has access to, to actual green space. Um, this pandemic has exposed, as we've talked about, the inequities uh, to nature while, um, you know, uh, magnifying the importance of just getting into, into gr green space and, you know, walking in, uh, in forests. Um, how, how do each of you uh, look at this uh, from the perspective of, of cities, you know, a post-industrial city, a city, Mitch, that you're in, which has incredible density? Uh, how do we ensure that all residents can have some sort of access uh, close to home to nature? Right. Well, we have a general campaign, a million tree campaign, which we completed a few years ago. We're always incre increasing our urban canopy. Uh, a city, we have 30,000 acres of park parks, and we have 10,000 acres of that is natural areas. So we're always increasing our urban canopy. And 
part of our other initiative when we redo a park is we break up the asphalt and we make it a lot more greener so people do have that access to green space. Even on our streets, uh, we have an analysis of where we know that we call it the cool neighborhoods, where we need to increase the number of trees on our streets. And so this is just a commitment for this city. We know that trees, it's great for mental health, but also for air quality, water quality, and it cools the city. And so we're very committed to more street trees, more trees in our parks. And when we redo a park, we make sure there's a lot more trees for cooling and just for the experience for people to experience more green space. So that's something that we we'll can we'll keep doing until we can plant every tree we can in New York City. Yeah, in, in Philly, um, you know, we we're, you know have similar efforts underway. We're doing um, our first urban forestry master plan um, that, that is underway uh, right now. And then we're also doing the city's first urban agriculture plan. So um, those two plans are really hyper-focused on um, communities, the urban forestry plan communities where um, the urban tree canopy is very low, where there is high level of heat vulnerability. Um, and then for the urban agriculture ba- uh, plan, really focused on uh, communities of color um, where, um, you know, um, farms and, and, and growing things um, in, in gardens and farms is um, uh, critically important from a cultural perspective and a historic perspective um, and is, is vulnerable here in Philadelphia as we are a city that is rapidly developing and rapidly gentrifying. And a lot of those um, urban farms and um, gardens and green spaces and orchards are, are you know, are threatened um, because of development. So this urban agriculture plan is going to help us identify where those vulnerable um, sites are and how do we make sure that we um, consider everything through a racial equity lens um, in terms of helping to, um, you know, make those sites more permanent and to bring them into, um, you know, into our inventory as a protected public space. Um, but then we're also, um, you know, through the rebuild initiative, which which um, we mentioned a few times, this is a, a massive um, investment in parks and recreation centers and library that's happening right now. Um, And it's basically giving us a chance to to reimagine what our parks and recreation centers look like. Many of our recreation centers were built 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, They are surrounded by by concrete and fences and rebuild gives us a chance to reimagine them and to bring, you know, green space and nature um, into those sites in a way that we just, you know, they weren't originally envisioned and um, we haven't had the resources to do up till now. It also gives us a chance to think about ways to connect those centers into our natural areas. We have six watershed parks. We have some beautiful urban forests and just not a lot of connection points and access points and simple signage that makes people aware of, of what is there. So people go to the playground or to the neighborhood park that they know, but they're not venturing further into these amazing watershed parks or these these forests or woods areas um, because they don't know what's there because we haven't signed them appropriately or we haven't held walking tours. So we're doing more and more of that too to really um, encourage people to get out beyond their um, you know their their front step and their neighborhood park and their recreation center to to travel more into those into those areas. Um, really, we want to make sure people have ownership of those areas um, and really help us drive the vision for what those spaces can can look like and how they can be used in the future. Great. So it really is about, you know, thinking about uh, our, our parks and, and rec systems really more, more as a, a porous system and creating those linkages between the, the various assets that you have, as well as that programming and education uh, and community stewardship. That's great. There's another question that's come in. Um, uh, I think going back to um, the the programming of streets and the um, question is the efforts to close streets in other cities have had some pushback from those who see some of those efforts benefiting more affluent neighborhoods and setting circumstances of selected enforcement. The play streets idea in Philadelphia and the efforts in New York City seem to be coming from a different place. Is this correct? Well, for um, us, it definitely, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Catherine. 
Okay. For us, it definitely was. We, um, you know, we had tons of requests coming in, um, you know, from folks to close uh, streets in, in some of those affluent neighborhoods. And, and uh, that, thank God, was not, uh, I wasn't in charge of that. That was the streets department um, who had to respond to that. But when we um, thought of the Play Street idea, it definitely was coming from a place of equity. It, it was coming from a place of, again, saving summer for the most vulnerable population, you know, and making sure that young people had, you know, um, memories. Um, and um, experiences that, um, you know, weren't plagued by um, by trauma and loss. You know, even before COVID, children in these communities, you know, um, are dealing with such a, you know, such chaotic lives and such, such you know, intense trauma in their young lives that layer on top of that COVID, layer on top of that the murder of George Floyd, layer on top of that, you know, um, you know, police brutality and violence throughout our city. Um, you know, there there is just... Um, you know, so little positivity coming into the lives of young people. And so this really was the idea that, again, if kids can't get to us, how do we get to kids? And how do we make sure that we meet children where they are on their front step in their neighborhoods um, to provide them with the, with those experiences? Well, from our perspective, we just focused on the entire city uh, because we knew not every neighborhood had access to a large park or a passive park. So with 100 miles, that was a lot of coverage. This really was pushed by the city council. So the mayor challenged both the parks department and department transportation to locate where this makes the most sense, understanding that there are some communities of color that had, did not have access to a, a larger park. And so out of the 100 miles, we did it over time in phases. And it was quite effective, uh, but we did do a focus on areas that did not have access to quality or large passive parks. Those did tend to be some of the underserved communities. And so for us, that was where it came from. There was just a concern. There were no outdoor spaces to go to. Uh, New York City is a very dense city, 27,000 people per square mile. And so we knew uh, for that many people, in isolation, had to go outside to exercise. And so the open streets serve that purpose across all boroughs. But we didn't get much complaints. From the drivers, yes. Some streets were closed, some were slow streets, uh, but so far the program is working and we're looking to see how that pilot could even continue uh, next year. Great, thank um, I have a question that just came in. Since master planning is essential to the parks and recreation process, would each of you give one thing the pandemic has taught us that needs to be added to our plans going forward? I would say, uh, I mean, I've sort of already said this, um, so I hope it's, I don't sound like a broken record, but again, it's more about a, a master planning value for me than a specific, um, you know, pragmatic tactic. And that is the values of, you know, innovation, relevancy, and having that adaptive capacity. You know, we have got to be able to remain relevant to the communities and the cities that we're serving. Um, we can't be stuck. We can't, um, you know, just um, be content with, you know, what we've done. And as voids, um, you know, expose themselves, you know, whether it's around food access or, you know, heat vulnerability or, um, you know, um, public space access, Access or racial equity, we have to be prepared to fill those voids and have to think about ways that we in parks and recreation can, you know, can can provide the answers to that. Um, and so it's constantly thinking about ways that you can adapt and innovate, um, you know, to remain relevant to, to your mission. Uh, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, and it's the public realm. Uh, to me, the biggest untapped resource in every city is the public realm. It's owned by the public. You don't have to buy it. You can just reprogram it. So parks sits for the most part in isolation behind fences or gates and walls in a confined space. It is my hope as we do master planning, what about the sidewalk or the outer park? What about reinventing the street? What about some of these plazas? I remember when Jeanette City Khan closed off Times Square, it was like, what are you doing? It's going to choke traffic. It worked. And now we're replicating that in Madison Square. So we're taking a look at the public realms. I said earlier, parks, 14 percent, streets and sidewalks in New York City, 26 percent. 40% of New York City is in the public realm, and that's quite similar to other cities. So I believe in future uh, master planning for parks, let's start looking at all of the public realm. Just because it's not under parks department doesn't mean it can't be greened, have benches, be wonderful public spaces, and expand the parks portfolio without acquiring 
any additional land. So very often parks planning can be very siloed. I believe it needs to be merged with the other departments and the other public realm. So to me, looking at a seamless public realm going forward is the best thing future park master planning can do. That's great. Uh, we have about 30 seconds left, and I wanted to quickly ask you each, um, um, in the midst of this pandemic, has there been any unexpected ray of hope for you? Just very briefly. I have a heightened level of respect for Parks employees. To see what they did during this pandemic, uh, my level of respect went from here through the roof. Uh, that's the one thing that I saw them step up in the challenge. To me, they're my heroes. They were the unsung heroes, frontline workers during the pandemic. Mitch stole my answer. I totally, I totally agree. I, I feel the same way that uh, it's such an honor for me to be a part of this, of this department with this incredible group of people who are, um, you know, just, um, just dedicated and, um, you know, just, beyond human. <laughs> They're incredible. Great. Uh, well, thank you both for your extraordinary leadership uh, during these challenging times and to your staff and uh, to all folks who are working in parks and recreation, uh, whatever kind of organization they're affiliated with. Uh, we, we've really seen the, the power uh, and, and of parks and, and how essential they are to um, our very lives. Uh, and thank you all for spending time with us to, on today's webinar. City Parks Alliance will continue to explore the issues discussed today through ongoing programs. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges that all cities have, as we've heard, is how to fund our parks uh, to ensure that everyone in urban communities have access to them. Uh, in September, we'll launch an equitable funding hub through our website, which will provide information about different funding strategies that can be used to leverage resources for parks in the neighborhoods that need them the most. And in future webinars, we'll be looking at partnerships to help develop, program, and steward community spaces. Be sure to sign up for updates through our website at cityparksalliance.org. Uh, and thank you again for all the great work that you're doing locally in the Atlanta region. So this concludes our session. Uh, we appreciate your joining us and participating in today's great conversation. Up next, we're going to hear from uh, Wandi Stewart, who will share Park Pride's final Inspiration Award winner of 2020. And then after a short break, we'll all meet back here for the final keynote, Jason Ward at 1 p.m. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your time at the conference. <laughs>